Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be looking at and discussing a few more pictures from the James Webb Telescope that recently became publicly available for everyone to peruse. And although by now we've seen a lot of incredible pictures from this telescope, I think today you're going to see some of the best ones, at least one of them. And interestingly enough, most of these pictures have actually been produced not by professional astronomers, but by people like you and me, either amateur astronomers or citizen scientists simply doing this as their hobby or for fun. And this one particular person has been doing an incredible job at producing some of the most mind-blowing pictures. This person right here, Judy Schmidt, who started producing these images approximately 10 years ago, mostly for fun, and has now become not just an expert, but one of the best experts in being able to take raw data and create something visually stunning out of it. As a matter of fact, in some of the previous videos, a lot of these images were produced by her, and you can actually check out her Flickr account to see some of these images. Flickr? Who still uses Flickr? I used to use it a long time ago. But anyway, moving on. Let's talk about what she produced, what these images mean, and how all of this was made. And let's start with the best image we've seen so far. The image of Jupiter. Jupiter with so much detail that it actually really surprised a lot of the scientists. We see so many more features here that have ever been seen before. Now by itself, I could probably spend an hour just talking about this picture alone. There's just so much happening here. And let me just show you some of the things that Judy was able to recreate. So first of all, we definitely see the rings of Jupiter. They're not as big as the ones on Saturn, but they're surprisingly easily visible here, along with the moon Andrastea that's actually part of the rings. And the slightly larger moon Amalthea right next to it. Now you might remember when the James Webb telescope released its first image, it had these huge diffraction spikes that are actually formed because of the hexagonal shape of the telescope. And extremely bright objects will usually produce extremely long spikes. As you can see in this case, we also see several diffraction spikes from the relatively bright southern aurora, which most likely resembles something like this. But remember, this is in infrared light. So in this case, it seems to produce very bright infrared emissions. Around the same spot, there's also Io's footprint. And this is sort of produced by the interaction of moon Io and the material that's escaping from the moon and the very powerful magnetosphere of Jupiter. We've discussed some of these concepts previously in the video that should be right there or maybe in the description. With the image also revealing a lot of different swirling around the northern and southern poles. It becomes easier visible in this other image produced by Judy where the swirls are represented in yellow and green. And in this case, these hazes are just different types of gases with very specific temperature visible to the James Webb Telescope. And the bluish colors you see on Jupiter is essentially the light reflected from the deeper parts of the clouds. Although interestingly, the iconic great red spot appears entirely white simply because it seems to reflect a lot of sunlight in various frequencies. And because it's much higher in altitude than other clouds, it forms very different colors as well, with various storms also represented with bright colors. But interestingly enough, even in this image, it seems that there are at least several galaxies, really far away galaxies, that are sort of visible in the background. And it looks like this is going to be the case for every image that James Webb Telescope takes. These galaxies are going to be photobombing everything every time. But anyway, a pretty amazing picture and an incredible recreation of the data from the James Webb. Although as a side note, all of this is publicly available, so in theory, anyone could create this. Now, I'm probably going to be making a video about how to do all of this and how to actually create these yourselves, but it's a much more technical video and obviously will not appeal to everyone. Nevertheless, in a nutshell, what Judy does here is use one of the freely available data products from NASA, such as the ones you find right here, known as the MAST, Mikulski Archive for Space Telescopes. And all of this data is publicly available and it's constantly updated. Meaning that anyone can actually download this, but it doesn't come as a JPEG file. It comes in a format known as FITS, which by itself will usually look like a monochrome or black and white image with just raw data in it. And so it actually takes quite a while for a lot of astronomers, and in this case Judy, to take individual frequencies and assign colors to them while also processing these images in other ways, in order to make them look so brilliant and so beautiful. The raw data by itself does not look anything like this. And as a matter of fact, in the past, when I tried to do this myself, it takes hours and hours of work just to get something that kind of looks like some of the pictures we see. 
but it does take a lot of practice and a lot of understanding of the limitations of individual instruments in order to create something remarkable and something amazing. But as I said in theory, it's totally possible to do this for anyone. Just take some time and a little bit of practice. In other words, if you do have a lot of time on your hands, get on it. Okay, moving on to the second image. So this was also based on some of the raw data released by the telescope and not detected by anyone before, but also not really processed in any major way either. Nevertheless, here's what the scientists discovered. This is at a distance of roughly around 2000 light years away from us. And it's an object that seems to be only visible in certain frequencies of infrared light, suggesting that it has a temperature of about 600 Kelvin. Just a little bit cooler than Venus, but much hotter than Earth. And what you're looking at right here seems to be some kind of a brown dwarf, specifically a T-type. An extremely rare type of an object that until now was always extremely difficult to find because they don't really produce a lot of light. And unlike some of the other brown dwarfs, such as L dwarfs, which do produce a lot more heat and have more frequencies coming out of them, T dwarfs generally seem to be kind of dim, but looks like bright enough to be detected by the James Webb. And specifically, they seem to produce just the right colors and just the right amount of heat in order to be visible 2000 light years away. Which also implies that some of the data from this particular study and these recent images are going to serve as a kind of a groundwork to discover possibly thousands if not millions of these objects in places where they've never been seen before. Up until now, only 400 of these objects have been discovered. With this particular object very likely resembling something like this. Something that's about 31 masses of Jupiter, about 5 billion years old, so just a little bit older than Jupiter, with the constant temperature of 600 Kelvin. But for now, that's kind of all we know about this object and about this image. Okay, next image. Once again from Judy Schmidt, this time a galaxy known as NGC 1365. A very intriguing galaxy that seems to have not one, but two bar-like formations right in the center. There's a longer bar and a shorter bar inside of it. All of this approximately 56 million light years away from us. Just to give you an optical comparison, here's what this galaxy looks like using some of the other telescopes, such as the ones located in Chile. But naturally, the infrared light reveals a lot of new detail that was previously invisible. As a matter of fact, because there's so much gas here that seems to hide the internal structure of the galaxy, this particular galaxy was chosen as one of the first targets for the James Webb. And right away, that second bar becomes much more visible in infrared images. In this case, the scientists believe that this particular bar very likely causes a lot of the gas to be drawn into the core of the galaxy in order to both form new stars, but also to feed the supermassive black hole in the middle. The black hole that's about 2 million solar masses, or about half the size of the one in the middle of our own galaxy. And because of this, the center here, as you can see, is kind of bright. It's bright because this is an active galactic nucleus. The black hole here is actively feeding and producing quite a lot of heat and a lot of energy, but not as actively as some of the more massive ones. Although I guess one intriguing question is, why is it that it has this unusual shape here? Well, it seems that the inner bar rotates a little bit faster than the larger, longer bar, and that creates a diagonal shape that you see in this image. But this is naturally just some of the first images and some of the first discoveries. The actual studies about this galaxy are not complete yet, so we don't really know what the scientists are going to find here, but it's definitely going to be interesting to find out. Anyway, let's go to the next image. Actually, this one is more of a mosaic of 690 individual frames and covers an area that's about 8 times larger than the first image revealed by the James Webb. Here, it's kind of difficult to see the detail, but it's full of different galaxies with many never seen before, with the actual image, the one with high resolution, being way too big for me to even display on this computer, it just cannot open it without crashing. With the scientists behind this image already discovering some of the more ancient galaxies as well that we've discussed in one of the previous videos. In this case, the one with the redshift of 14. And then we have this image right here that potentially shows the formation of some of the earliest global clusters in existence of the universe. The objects that even today are kind of mysterious in terms of their origins. But objects that are generally used for a lot of different analysis and a lot of studies in modern astronomy. There are actually quite a lot of them in the Milky Way, roughly around 150, and today it's believed that all of these are remnants of ancient galaxies and specifically their cores. And as the Milky Way galaxy interacted with them, only this was left behind. And normally these clusters are only about 100 to maybe 200 light years across, but will contain thousands and thousands of different stars, sometimes even several million stars in a relatively small volume of space. More importantly though, 
All of these are extremely old. They very often possess some of the oldest stars in the universe, or at least in our own galaxy. But at the moment it's not really entirely clear how they were actually formed themselves. We understand that they probably had something to do with ancient galaxies, but what exactly formed these objects? Well, today it's believed that many of them are at least 12 to sometimes 13 billion years old, suggesting that they were created around the redshift of 5. Or essentially, if we were to look back in the universe at the redshift of 5, we should be seeing the formation of these objects. And so one of the possible formation theories here is really in regards to the initial galaxy. Maybe these clusters are formed with the initial galaxy and need a lot of different gas and a lot of different stars in order to assume their shape. Although eventually, as the galaxy evolves, it might interact with other galaxies, leaving behind nothing but the cluster itself. Or maybe the clusters form naturally from something else and using some kind of other mechanism, and would actually require high density of gas and stars to form, which means that they would generally not be forming anymore and would only form at certain times in the universe. And so to try to answer some of these questions, the scientists once again used one of the images that we've talked about before, SMAX J0723, with a very powerful gravitational lens that allows the scientists to see really far away, with a specific focus being very small point sources seen around the gravitational lenses. In this case, the scientists refer to them as sparkles, with one galaxy named Sparkler, because of its high magnification of about 100, revealing quite an interesting sight. You're essentially looking at a very distant galaxy that existed about 9 billion years ago. And here they find at least 12 of these sparkles around the sparkler. Or in other words, potentially 12 global clusters around this young galaxy. And at least 5 of them seem to be evolved global clusters that already existed at this period of time. But also since these are global clusters, it looks like the star formation has already stopped there which potentially implies that these objects form in some natural way without the need for a galaxy. And more specifically, they might have formed in the first 500 million years of the existence of the universe, because back then the universe was much denser, there was a lot more gas, way more stars, and a lot more of these objects could have formed using some natural phenomenon that we still don't really understand. And even though we still don't really exactly know how global clusters formed, Images like this one are taking us a step closer in order to answer these mysteries once and for all. Lastly, we have this image. Okay, actually, this is another interpretation of the image I just showed you. But in this case, it shows us what the scientists think is some kind of a galactic protocluster, with the red and green circles showing us the galaxies that are very likely coming slowly together, representing a progenitor to what you see right here. An actual galactic cluster with a lot of mass inside of it which then is sometimes used as a gravitational lens. But in this case, they still have not combined into a larger cluster and are still slowly approaching each other. With one of the main discoveries coming from the study being in regards to the amount of invisible mysterious dark matter present in these galaxies. It actually seems to match the amount we typically expect from a much larger galactic cluster. Which means that by the time these galaxies combine into a larger formation, they're basically going to resemble something like this a lot of dark matter, several galaxies in the middle, huge amounts of mass. But in this case, this is the light that traveled the universe for 13 billion years, meaning that this is still early universe and the galactic clusters still have not formed. And so the data from this particular study might actually help the scientists figure out how these huge clusters ended up forming in the last few billions of years and why so many of them eventually acquired so much mass that they now create these beautiful lensing effects. The study for this is as always in the description below. But I guess on that note, well, so a few more images, a few more studies, a few more discoveries. More to come very likely next week. As a matter of fact, I'm kind of having trouble catching up to all the discoveries and all of the new images. So many of them are so incredible that I don't even know where to start. But we'll come back more and talk about this in some of the future videos. So subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt that actually now features James Webb Telescope as well. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.